Man of Steel was one of the biggest blockbusters of the year. It's the third highest grossing Hollywood picture of 2013 thus far. It had a mountain of hype behind it, and it has stirred controversy months after its release. Although riddled with problems, one must confess that the concept, on paper, is clever enough and might have worked under different direction. The movie asks the question, what is it like to feel responsible for the fate of the entire world? Rather than showing a smiling Superman, this film presents how challenging it must be growing up under those conditions, and how difficult it must be to put it into action as an adult. In spite of this premise, the film is plagued by errors in judgment, the structure of the story, the oversimplification of its message, and of course, the absolutely awful way it was shot. Man of Steel director Zack Snyder made the decision to shoot his Superman origin story with a heavy diet of close-ups and the dreaded shaky cam. Instead of meticulously detailed scenes with the best angle, best proportion, and the best placement for lighting, Shaky Cam employs guerrilla-style faux documentary visuals. It is rarely used well. Man of Steel not only overuses Shaky Cam, but it also uses it in the worst possible places, guaranteed to murder an emotional moment. This scene will be discussed more later, but first, a brief aside about how to use Shaky Cam correctly. This is a scene from Saving Private Ryan. Soldiers storm the beach, bravely pushing forward and facing death. The director, in this case Steven Spielberg, is employing the aforementioned shaky cam technique, lending to the horrible realism of the carnage. It also reminds us of World War II newsreels and footage we may have seen before. Because the war was a real event, the style of cinematography here subconsciously gives us the idea that this is really happening on screen, suspending our disbelief for just long enough for it to affect us. It is easily one of the best uses of shaky guerrilla camera work, and it was completely proper for this particular scene. But with Man of Steel, we got this. Shaky cam in completely inappropriate scenes. In this part of the story, young Clark's adopted father is having a serious heart-to-heart -heart with the boy about responsibility. The father knows right from wrong and wants to raise his son to do good in the world, but he is conflicted because if the child becomes a superhero and known to the world, the lad could risk his safety. Clark is naturally afraid of what might happen to him as well, but he feels a sense of responsibility to the world. He has all this power and needs to put it to use to save people. There is a lot going on in this one scene. Indeed, it would be the best part of the whole movie and really allow us to feel the aforementioned concept of the weight Superman must feel every day. Except that it is shot guerrilla style for no good reason and jumps about in an epileptic fit, distracting us and ruining the whole moment. It was the worst possible choice for this scene, and the director went ahead with it anyway. In Snyder's earlier superhero film, Watchmen, he took another unusual and confounding visual choice of injecting an unhealthy amount of slow motion to the film. In 300, fight scenes used speed-up, slow-down shots that added nothing to the drama except to look cool in a very superficial way. It turned this historically inaccurate, but still potentially epic film into a very silly music video. Snyder is known for his visual style, but he so often makes a mess of it. The way a film is shot lends to how we experience it. Film is a visual medium, and how it is presented should be significant to the story, not some Me Too latching on to tired, overdone cinematography, especially a trend that is more often misused than used correctly. Man of Steel did not need to look like The Hunger Games. In fact, The Hunger Games did not need to look like The Hunger Games either. Moving on here, Man of Steel is mired in other problems too, not only visually. Beneath the surface of the film, much of the story seems to suggest that the origin of Superman is an allegory for the life of Jesus Christ. Even putting aside this has been done far too many times in film, it is not even well done in Man of Steel. In this scene, director Zack Snyder tells us the meaning of his movie with the subtlety of a bullhorn. Superman is seen next to this image of Jesus. Superman came from the heavens to save the world. The Christ metaphor is already there, but Snyder went one step too far. There is a difference between creating a work of fiction with underlying themes and announcing what everything really means over a loudspeaker. A film protagonist as a stand-in for Jesus Christ is incredibly common. Every Tom, Dick, and Neo is Jesus nowadays. The Matrix is a prime example of hammering the concept of the Christ metaphor into the minds of the audience. 
It comes across more as a lecture. The three main characters are the Holy Trinity, including one character actually named Trinity. In addition to all this, if this were not obvious enough, an unimportant character in the beginning of the film calls Neo my savior, my own personal Jesus Christ. In terms of over-explaining the point of the story, this falls in somewhere around someone turning to face the camera and saying, well gang, here's what we've learned today. Good filmmakers go a different route. When a writer or director is trying to give his or her story weight and inject greater depth and purpose and meaning behind the plot and characters, it's not actually an attempt to hide the agenda. Rather, it's a means in which to allow the purpose and underlying message of the story to appear naturally in the minds of the audience while watching the film, allowing them to participate in the narrative and give them a greater experience. If a film simply goes out of its way to blatantly tell the viewer what everything means during the movie itself, this robs that viewer of something special. It will mean more to us if we figure it out, and if we work it out in our own minds while we're watching the movie. The way Man of Steel is set up is an insult to the intelligence and creativity of the audience. People are actually smart. When we are hand-delivered the message, why even make it a work of fiction? That's why we have non-fiction. Man of Steel is, at least in part, about Jesus Christ. But rather than giving hints to the message, like, for example, in Paul Verhoeven's Robocop, Zack Snyder gives the audience no credit and puts Superman right next to the image of Jesus, as if to say, get it? Do you get it? It is unnecessary, and again, a little insulting. For the next problem with Man of Steel, a brief explanation may be required. There is a difference between explaining the surface and leaving the meaning of the film subtle. For the movie's theme, we are meant to slowly understand it on our own, but for the narrative, that is, everything on the skin of the movie, we need the basics told. Keep that in mind as we delve into the finale of this film. At the conclusion of this picture, Superman fights General Zod in a ridiculously overblown battle that is preposterous even by the standards of alien super beings in tights who look exactly like humans. Zod threatens to murder a few people with his heat vision, so Superman snaps his neck in a fit of rage. Superman is more distraught by his actions in this scene than he was when he watched his father die. Why is Superman so sad? Why is he devastated by what he just did? Is it because his father, either of them, told him never to kill another intelligent being? Is he violating this instruction? Well, no, he's not. Whether or not Superman believes he can or should kill someone was never brought up prior to this. Superman killing Zod upset a lot of comic book fans because the world's most famous superhero typically does not do that in the source material. That's a valid feeling to have, but the issue with this scene goes far beyond its effect on comic fans. The trouble with it is also structural. In an earlier Superman film, in the wake of the death of Lois Lane, Superman remembers what his father Jor-El said about affecting the course of human history and why it is wrong. He hears his voice so clearly, but Superman makes a tough decision and changes it anyway. The build to this scene and the implications of what it means, disobeying his code, gives it more weight. In Man of Steel, there was no build and therefore no context to why Superman is horribly upset. Based on Superman's reaction in the climax, the whole movie seems to have been building to this moment, but without any actual build. It is put together so poorly. Now, we can always say, killing is wrong and that's why he's upset. We don't need any explanation. There's a problem with that though. In an action film, we have come to expect the heroes to kill the villains at the end. The T-1000 is killed, Hans Gruber dies, Princess Leia strangles Jabba the Hutt, and so forth. Thus, if one wants to establish a protagonist in an action movie who has serious moral qualms with killing anyone for any reason, that needs to be heavily established. In Man of Steel, it is not. That means the climactic battle not only upset comic fans, but also anyone watching the film who is trying to figure out why anyone should care. There are tons of other problems, the ungodly length of the film, the shoehorned love story, but this could go on forever. Instead, we shall simply finish with this. The trouble with Man of Steel is not that it is too dark for a Superman film. It wasn't even that dark. And whether or not Superman should be gritty and realistic or not is a matter of preference. The trouble with Man of Steel is that it is structurally flawed from the roof to the basement. 
Good concept, terrible execution.